As the party rushes into the room, the goblin mechanic cackles as his creation comes to life. Tearing the room asunder around it, the party can hear an ominous mechanical roar. <laughs> You're gonna get it now, suckers. Thanks for all the help. All jokes aside guys, this one's been in the background of a few shots before, perhaps you've seen it just sitting around. Finally got a chance to paint it up, it seems someone saw it in the background of one of my live streams and just had to have it. So this was a fun commission to work on and I look forward to more fun projects like this in the future. So I was originally going to start a lot farther into this, but I wanted to cover more of what I was doing because I wanted to make this more of a proper tutorial, especially considering some of the videos of late. So I did a Zeniful highlight and then I hit it with lead belcher spray paint, and then I hit it with a few of the other silver colors by Citadel to kind of add some highlights, but that kind of ends up getting lost. Runefang Steel was one of the best ones that I used, but again, this ended up getting lost by the time everything was all said and done, and I used Runefang Steel as a bit of a dry brush in the end anyway. One of the big things that we ended up doing here is I ended up using a mix of washes, Agrax Earthshade, Seraphim Sepia, and a little bit of Nuln Oil. I even put a splash of Fugan Orange in there just to add a bit of color and variation to the metals. In my opinion, this dragon is probably patchworked together from a very serious series of, well, stolen bits and parts. This dragon was probably not built with the consent of any major authority in whatever town it started in. Here you can see this was after my first initial wash, first hit of the airbrush with Seraphim Sepia. I start laying in some Agrax Earthshade and then we skip forward to when I've kind of laid back all, all of the silver dry brushing. So something to keep in mind when you start your dry brushing phase with something like this, especially if, like me, you want to still have that pot metal look where you can see all these imperfections in the surface of the metal, and in other places you can see a lot of dirt and grime in the crevices, is dry brushing. Dry brushing is going to be your friend with something like this. If you do all traditional edge highlighting and you just do it all with a brush, you're going to have a bad time because of all the little nicks and nooks you're going to have to try to avoid versus all of the raised surfaces you're going to have to just pick at with a brush. It's not worth it. Just go ahead and dry brush this whole stage. It'll save you a ton of time and if you have to fix something later then you can come in and fix it with a brush. So here you can see me using Screaming Bell Copper to paint the outer hubs on all of the kneecaps as well as any of those other circular drums. There's a few in the wings and there's a few scattered throughout the rest of the model. And I'm just hitting those with some copper and we'll hit those with a bit of uh, verdigris later with a very bright teal blue. Uh, there's a very specific paint by Games Workshop but we'll cover that when we come to the weathering stage. I wanted to add a bit of color to his rib cage. Um, I did a bad job at filming this, but there is just a almost gear tooth style rib that runs down the front of his chest there. And we just get a nice good even coat of that screaming bell copper on top of that. There were a few tubes on this guy. And so what we did is if it was in a dark area, I wanted to brighten it up and use some of the Screaming Bell Copper. If it was in a darker area or a more exposed to sunlight where it would be obvious that it wasn't a shadow and that it was an intentional paint design, we used Warp Block Bronze. I did this because I wanted different types of metallics on the model, but I also did this because I wanted to help it break up the shape of the model as well. We end up painting that mask that is his face in copper, although when we do the purple effect later on, it kind of gets lost. I wanted there to be some aged copper somewhere on here, as though some copper that was being used was quite old. And I found the best way to do this was to actually take some Vallejo thinner, 
to the Screaming Bell copper that we were using and then apply it in very thin washes. And we only ended up needing one wash for this particular model. I apologize for getting most of this off screen, but I wanted to explain what I was doing because you'll be able to see much later on in the video just how good of a dark, dingy copper we were able to get. And it ends up taking the verdigris weathering treatment really, really well. I wanted to bring some more color into this piece and I realized that the cowling on the back of the neck was completely shaped differently from almost anything else on the model and I thought well this has got to tell some kind of story. Surely this is something that's been stolen, maybe rooftop vents or something that's probably made from cast iron and what I ended up doing is I hit it with about four washes of non oil to knock it down and make it look like pot metal or a very dark, almost cast irony metal. I ended up being very lucky with doing this wash and after about the third or fourth I realized that this was acting a lot like contrast paints. Only difference here is because it was more of a wash, it really really seeped down into the recesses and stayed off the highlights really well and I ended up deciding to not have to do any real edge highlighting except for late in the weathering stage where I added just a tiny bit of highlights back in but I honestly think you could have skipped that. So looking back I should have recorded this stage and done some kind of high speed playback but you guys have seen me edge highlight before and that's really all I was doing here with the gold. I just went in and picked out everything that looked like a separate piece of metal on a body panel. So example, the area that's kind of in the saddle region, you can see that gold stripe around that metal panel. I went in and found all the little trim bits and hit it with gold as well. And honestly guys, did you really want to watch me highlight that neck for 20 minutes doing all of the gold on both sides? It was right around this time when I realized that the area in which the wings connect into the body, I was originally going to do those in bronze, but then I kind of realized that that doesn't necessarily look like metal. And that's when I realized that honestly, this area of the model was probably intended to be a hard leather, a flexible surface so that when the wings are moving, they can actually move around enough to propel the dragon through the air. And I realized that we really needed to do those in a leather color or else it would just look off. Now it was time to tackle the wings. I realized that the dragon really wasn't quite where I wanted it to be. And I always envisioned that the wings would be this patchwork of just stolen fabrics. However, the gentleman who commissioned me is a real big fan of purple. And so in the wings, a lot of the fabric ends up becoming purple by the time this video is done, just because there wasn't enough for his satisfaction. And at the end of the day, it's his model and I wanted to make sure he was happy. So a lot of the work initially gets done with various different contrast paints to kind of change these different pieces of fabric into different colors. And then a few of the scraps that were brown end up getting translated all the way over to a purple tone using various bits of uh, Zarius purple. I went ahead and I painted up the base mostly using, uh, I believe it's Tuscor fur, uh, contrast paints. I wanted to go ahead and knock the base out so we went ahead and hit everything else with their main base tones and then we won't really touch this again until it's time for weathering. So I really wanted to play off the idea that those two teardrop shapes were stolen shields from the city guard. And I basically went in and looked up heraldry on Google of all things and I found out what different shapes mean and why certain colors would be in certain ways. And as far as I could tell this was the most generic -y setup I could get to express royal guard. But I also threw some purple stripes in on top of the white, or in this case a singular white stripe indicating heraldry of a higher order which could be nobility or above 
and I threw on the purple because again the customer loves purple. I threw in the blue because blue is a very regal color and then I threw in red because that would be the fighting guard according to what information I could find. So in, I, in other words this would have been owned by the guard that would go and escort someone of high stature in and out of the city or would be walking around patrolling just outside of the castle keep. Please also keep in mind that I am not an expert, this is just what I found on Google and this information may not be correct at all. This is just what I was using to give me an idea of what I wanted to put on those shields. I know you guys really like it when I kind of do some high speedy stuff and I know you like when I show off the airbrush even if I don't do a good job at recording it. I apologize, I am working on my setup and trying to get things better for you guys. But here I am just laying in a dark purple to get the initial shadows and shades in for this glow effect. And then I'm just real easily going in with a lighter purple and just kind of laying in some base tones in between those ribs. As well as almost, I would describe it as dry brushing with an airbrush. And just mildly catching the surface of all of that texture on the ground and just kind of laying in some hot spots to show as though the lights are moving around inside the dragon therefore the reflection on the ground is moving. So I had a bit of an accident when airbrushing. I didn't recognize that there was a clog and I pulled back just a little too far. Luckily that clog didn't spit out onto the face of the dragon however it did just put a bunch of paint on the surface and I end up constantly going in and tweaking little things and adjusting things and fixing that throughout the rest of the video but for the most part uh, I am just going in with some spectral white now spectral white is a whitish purple by Reaper miniatures I really like it for things like this because it allows you to add color to things that you normally wouldn't if I was just going to edge highlight something with white and I've already got purple tones on the model, I might as well use this color. And they have a green one as well, but I'm just not sure what it's called. As you can see here, I'm just touching up a few spots where the glow effect kind of fades away in places I didn't quite like, and touching that up so that it fades completely as it should. So you can see we've also added a bit of purple fade into that neck. I end up cleaning that up a bit more using some dry pigments later on in the video. Now what you can see me doing here is basically two brush wet blending. Now the first brush is the eyedropper with rubbing alcohol in it. And the second one has the spectral white that is actually watered down. And what this is doing is the paint is basically mixing with the rubbing alcohol on the surface of the model and it's allowing those original purple tones to show through as highlights even though the spectral white is much brighter and the spectral white is settling in the recesses of the ground texture. In my opinion this does a really good job at showing the fact that the lights could be moving around inside of the dragon as opposed to just sitting still and giving off a set constant light and to me this adds a bit more of a spectral glow to everything. I wasn't super happy with the way the base had turned out so far. My original intent had been that this dragon was erupting out of its own workshop. Something about the idea of the master's creation going awry really played well in my mind when I had designed this base originally. And I felt it was about time to pay that original idea forward and actually implement it here. So one of my next big changes is a lot of dry brushing and a lot of pigment work to kind of knock things back down into the gray tones as opposed to brown for dirt. For the weathering process I ended up using a mixture of AK Interactive weathering pigments as well as Vallejo weathering pigments. I have some older Vallejo weathering pigments that I'm not sure if they make anymore or perhaps they've just changed the color. I'm really going to have to look into that. I was able to do my burnt wood effect with a tutorial that I've actually already done on this page but I really like doing it in small scale so I decided to include that here on this little plinth. One of the reasons I wanted the miniature raised up as high as it was is I wanted someone to have a goliath mini or something of that nature to be able to be underneath the maw of the dragon. I also wanted to make sure that it was a large enough base that it would be the proper size for a dragon of its scale according to the monster manual. 
I think you'll agree with me that at the end of the day this miniature looks absolutely fantastic. Now unfortunately this tutorial has gone on for long enough. I would like to do some more in-depth tutorials and they will be coming soon. But for now, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Please leave a like if you did or dislike if you didn't like it. Either way, it still helps the algorithm to help other people find me. Subscribe if you aren't already and if you'd like to support me, there'll be ways to do that in the link tree in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate all the love and support you've not only shown this channel, but my other social medias. And as always, I hope your display case is always full and your pile of shame is never empty.